The Zelda franchise is no stranger to direct sequels throughout its lifetime. We've gotten Zelda 2, Majora's Mask, Phantom Hourglass, a Link Between Worlds, and so many more. It should have been no surprise that Breath of the Wild was getting a direct sequel. Breath of the Wild was a legendary game in the series that redefined everything, and it also sold incredibly well, selling nearly double of what Twilight Princess had sold previously, and that at the time was the best selling title in the franchise. And for some fucking reason we never got a direct sequel to Twilight Princess. I'm still salty about that. Even though Breath of the Wild was a masterpiece, it had its issues. The enemy variety was lacking, there's no real reason to attack enemy camps, and no Link's Awakening costume. Of course, it's a fantastic game, but a direct sequel would be perfect to fix many of its issues and bring new ideas to the table. In the previous two parts in the series, I've been discussing everything there is to know about Tears of the Kingdom, but now, as I finish up the series, I want to look into perhaps the most important part about it, the part that would determine if Tears of the Kingdom was a worthy success. This is Tears of the Kingdom Part 3, The Legendary Return. In universe, around 8 years have passed since Breath of the Hey, future Matthew here, and this is wrong. We don't have a definitive date, and I base that 8 years off of Hudson and Ronson's daughter, but there's no age set in the game. The Wild, and in real life, around 6 years. I mean, Link is old enough to where he can drink alcohol. While Tears of the Kingdom is a direct sequel to Breath of the Wild, the story is in a direct continuation, and there are only references to the previous title, which is both good and bad in different ways. It feels disappointing that they didn't tell us directly what happened to things like the Divine Beast or the Sheikah Towers, but it's fine. We got more interesting replacements anyways. Oh, by the way, play Breath of the Wild before you play Tears of the Kingdom. Other than the gameplay and a lot of things making more sense if you've played this game, it's worth it all on its own because of Verbosa. Other than the lack of cast, which sucks by the way, the biggest change that you'll see in Hyrule is that the Sheikah tech is completely gone. Well, for the most part. Guardians, shrines, and Sheikah towers have all been disassembled since I assume Zelda doesn't want to be traumatized anymore. Interestingly enough, some of the Sheikah tech has been repurposed to traumatize Link, I mean, to create Skyview Towers, Tears of the Kingdom's versions that launches him into the sky to scan the surrounding area. In Breath of the Wild, you just had to climb the Sheikah towers, which while they did give a challenge for some of them, I didn't really find it that hard. They were quite easy for the most part. For the Skyview Towers, however, they're completely different. First, you have to find a way inside, and it's quite clever how you have to do it. There's just Skyview Towers stuck in snow, with a terminal loose, and one in an enemy base. I really like this change, as now you actually have to think about how you're supposed to get inside. This is only the first step into re-exploring Hyrule. There's a new town, a blizzard, a drug epidemic, and Koroks with backpacks. And one of the new biggest changes in the overworld is Lookout Landing, which is Hyrule's newest town that sounds straight out of Fortnite. This is one of the first things that we see that indicates that Hyrule is rebuilding, which is a common theme throughout the game that you'll see a lot. So yeah, Hyrule has changed a lot in between this game and Breath of the Wild. There are caves, chasms, sky islands, enemy camps, new quark puzzles. What else can they possibly add? Oh. My. Gosh. After the upheaval strikes Hyrule, each of the major regions is suffering from a major phenomenon. With a blizzard in Hebra Village, a Gibdo invasion in Gerudo Town, Zora's domain is being polluted, and Goron City is suffering from... a crack addiction. In Breath of the Wild, the threat of the Divine Beast was there, but other than Varuta, I didn't really feel like they were super dangerous. But here, you can actively see how the people of each race are suffering. It helps to let us know that Ganondorf is a menace. Thankfully, these regional phenomenons aren't the only new things in Hyrule. In each major settlement, there are new additions in small and in big ways, which I'm really happy for. My favorites were the bunker in Grudo Town, which is really cool, and Zora's Domain, where a court made in the memory of Mipha was created. Goron City's new additions are a bit boring, though it's made up by Death Mountain feeling completely different with no lava anywhere. Rito Village has got to be great. We could get an igloo, we could get an expanded flight range, and we can get... Why is there a house? And that's not just for Hyrule. There are so many little and big changes that it's impossible to list all of them. From new puzzles, collectibles, to even Addison, an employee from Hudson who's fucking bad at his job. Love the commitment though. Hyrule has changed a lot in only a few years, and I loved returning to see every new change. Even the great fairies have changed a lot, with their locations changing alongside a new way to open them up that doesn't require you to go into debt. 
Instead, you have to go through this awesome quest chain to rebuild a musical true. And I thought it was awesome. Plus, near the end, there's a sick Xenoblade reference, which is amazing for a Xenoblade fan. As a direct sequel- <laughs> As a direct sequel to Breath of the Wild that builds upon, like everything, it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that the combat is mostly unchanged. Weapons break, time slows when you use your bow in the air, you still have to worry about your stamina, and you can't pet dogs. What they have changed helps to make the combat feel a lot better. There are still issues obviously, but I think this helps to just make it more fun in general. The first major change is the Fuse ability. Fuse offers endless possibilities and has so much fun to tinker with. It incentivizes you to explore and to fight big baddies everywhere. In addition, certain weapons now have unique traits that offer unique abilities under a certain condition. Zonite weapons get stronger if you fuse a Zonite material to it. Magic rods make magic better. Duh. And a lot more that would be too tiring for me to say in one video. While the combat is essentially unchanged from Breath of the Wild, Tears of the Kingdom adds a lot that makes you strategize with the materials that you have. While breaking was Breath of the Wild's most controversial feature, it also added strategy and did critical damage when it was broken. Tears of the Kingdom works on that system and makes it feel less frustrating while also being better. Another thing that I would say that Breath of the Wild didn't do well combat wise were the runes. I do understand that they were more focused on interacting with the world, but at the same time, you could upgrade stasis to affect enemies. But it's dog shit. It only lasts for a few seconds, and it lasts shorter when you need to run up to them. Tears of the Kingdom is much better in this regard. Instead of changing runes via the up button, you just have to hold down the L button and an ability will opens up. This is much better and lets you choose in the heat of the battle. Unless if you choose the map on accident. That's happened to me more than I'd like to admit. A feature introduced in Breath of the Wild was that you could throw weapons. It wasn't great, and I don't recommend it for most weapons. But you can't throw things. It's a cool feature if you like to throw things. Tears of the Kingdom, as usual, built upon this feature, and now you can throw anything you want. New items like the Muddle Bottle, Bright Bloom Seeds, and Elemental Fruits are all that benefit a lot from being thrown. You can use arrows for Bright Bloom Seeds like Joshua suggested, but don't listen to that fucker. Save your arrows, even though you can get a lot. One of the best things in Breath of the Wild were the champion abilities. They made you feel really insane and powerful. Rebosa's Fury was really cool for decimating foes. Rivali's Gale is great for traversing the tall mountains. Mifa's Grace is a great backup that fully heals you. Daruk's protection is... It's okay, I guess. So, what does Tears of the Kingdom offer as a replacement? What does it improve? It's gotta be something exciting, something that we've never seen in the franchise before. My guess is something really cool like being able to surf, or maybe something even cooler that we never would have thought of. <laughs> So, by far the most annoying and disappointing part of Tears of the Kingdom are the stages. I guess they wanted to take the general concept of the champions, but massively upgrade them, but instead they made them really frustrating. Instead of each ability being binded to a button, you have to go up to them and press A to activate their ability. That by itself is annoying, but I can live with it. What makes it worse is that they don't listen to you at all, and they get in your way constantly. After I'm done fighting an enemy and I'm trying to pick up their loot, I'll accidentally activate Tulin and the wind blows away all the enemies. It makes me want to bash my head into a wall. The others are less annoying, but at the same time, I wonder why Nintendo didn't think this through. Easily, most of them could have been put to a button input. Tulin's ability only should have been activated when you're gliding or in the air. Yenobo? Just make him not screw up vehicles, please. Sidon could be like Duruk's protection, but you just have to pull out your shield once. With Riju, it would just have been better if it activated when pulling out your bow. Mineru is... Just make her stronger, please. She is ridiculously weak. She's only really good with frost emitters, which can still screw you in battle. I don't think the concept of the sages are bad, but man they're implemented horribly and I constantly had to go in the menu to turn most of them off when exploring or fighting an enemy. I understand that a major theme of Tears of the Kingdom is that you're not alone anymore. You're able to rely on others and the scene near the end of the game shows that off perfectly, but in regular gameplay it sucks and I hate the sages. Something that Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom share is that their gameplay loop in Hyrule itself is very similar. You go to towers, scan an area, find a shrine, and do a lot of bullshit in between. 
So, how do they make the gameplay loop even better? How can they make the shrines stand out compared to the Sheikah ones? Well, first of all, they look so much better visually, and they play better too, in my opinion. There's 152 this time versus 120, but I feel like somehow they made it more varied and more fun to play through this time. For example, combat shrines here are completely different, and instead strip you of everything at the beginning, and put you into an enemy encampment with different puzzles, which is great. I always dreaded going to the boring combat trial shrines in Breath of the Wild, with there only being really three different types that just gave you a different guardian scout to defeat. I would also say that puzzles in these shrines are also much cooler that focus more on using your runes, but if you do get stuck, you can cheese them. A surprising amount, really, with rocket shields. It makes me conflicted, as on one hand, sometimes I get stuck, and this helped me not to look up solutions. On the other hand, it feels like Nintendo didn't test these shrines out enough. And also, Shrines of Blessings return, of course, but now, they look so fucking real. And they feel like a real blessing. Just. Look at it. Its version feels bland in comparison, and small. And there's water, for some reason. Tears of the Kingdom is so much cooler and feels more mystical in hindsight. After countless hours of recording, editing, and re-recording, the longest series I've ever made is finally over. Video games as a whole is something that I love so much, and it's games like Tears of the Kingdom that truly shows it off, alongside the Zelda series showing everyone what it is to be a video game. Tears of the Kingdom is going to be beloved for generations to come, just like Breath of the Wild and Ocarina of Time did when they released years and years ago. As a game, Tears of the Kingdom fixed nearly every issue I and many other people had with Breath of the Wild. It added the much needed gameplay variety that the original lacked, it added onto a masterpiece and is so good. Tears of the Kingdom adds and changes so much that it makes Breath of the Wild feel like a tech demo, and it itself was already revolutionary. We all hate Nintendo's bullshit sometimes, but it's games like these that remind me why I've always had a soft spot for Nintendo games ever since I became a gamer all the way back in 2012. There's a reason why people like Zelda. There's a reason why the series is so beloved. It's because the developers go above and beyond with each title that makes each experience memorable and innovative in ways that most never would have thought about. The Switch has been an amazing era for both players and the Zelda franchise alike. From Breath of the Wild to all the way to Tears of the Kingdom, the Switch has made the series better than ever before. This is a masterpiece. This is amazing. This changed everything. This is The Legend of Zelda. Tears of the Kingdom. Matthew is out of here! Thank you.